From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. In emails received from many parts of the country, I'm hearing gardeners say the same thing. This year has been really hard. Count me in on those voicing that sentiment. Gardeners know firsthand that climate change isn't something in the future, but something right here every day, right now. So I was fascinated to start reading about the climate change demonstration garden at the Cornell Botanic Gardens in Ithaca, New York, where since 2014, the team has been looking at the impacts of a shifting climate on gardens. What they've learned so far to help us prepare is our topic today, but first this message. Underwriting support from Color Blends, supplying top quality spring blooming Dutch flower bulbs to landscape professionals and ambitious home gardeners. More information on the web, colorblends.com. Sonia Skelly is Director of Education for the Cornell Botanic Gardens and an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Horticulture there. She's here to give us a virtual tour of Cornell's climate change demonstration garden and some of the takeaways so far that we can use to make our own gardens more resilient in the face of a shifting landscape. Welcome, Sonia. I'm so glad that you could take the time out during back to school peak season to talk about this. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Oh, it's sweet. It's, it's, I cannot believe that I did not know about this work. I, I, I just, I felt almost embarrassed when I discovered it, thanks to one of your colleagues who turned me on to the, the website and so forth. And so I've been reading a lot about what you've been doing and, um, The way the climate change demonstration garden, which we should say is just one small part of this incredible botanic garden at Cornell, um, but the way it's set up is deceptively simple, but wow, it's also so revealing about what's going on outside and what will continue to be going on as the planet continues to warm. So tell us a little bit about sort of like set the scene, give us a visual of the layout of the garden and what it's meant to help us understand. Yes, thank you. it is a small garden, and it's it's placed within our our vegetable garden, um, where we also do some um, demonstrations about sustainable gardening practices. And it's I, I um, I'm not sure of the square footage, but it it contains um, a high tunnel, which is basically a simple greenhouse with it's like a plastic covered um, over steel frame, and um, there are six raised beds inside of it, and then just outside of it uh, is another set of raised beds, six of them. And the idea is that outside of outside is today's climate. It's what's happening now, what you would see in your garden. And inside this greenhouse are we are manipulating the temperatures in there to approximate what may happen in the year 2050 according to um, different climate models. And what we're trying to give visitors a sense of is what's going to happen with the plants and using the plants as our the lens by which through which we look at how climate is going to affect these plants right and i've read um i think in an article in sierra club uh magazine or newsletter recently uh you were interviewed and and you you were apparently you gave a tour to the person and you were very um you made it very clear it was like you stepped inside the greenhouse and it was uncomfortable and then you stepped outside the greenhouse and it was more comfortable but you pointed out that the plants can't step outside the greenhouse can they that's right so even though we're using plants as the lens i think that the temperature difference between outside and inside when when visitors walk through it whether they're on a tour with me or our other um, docents or um, garden staff is it's warmer in there and um, some days it's just ambiently warmer because the the greenhouse captures sunlight and holds it better than it does outside Um, but when we are trying to approximate heat waves which is what's predicted for this area or more more frequent and longer um, heat waves we drop the sides of the tunnel down um, and uh, the sides of the greenhouse down and it gets really noticeably warmer in there yeah and so it's like you walk in and it just kind of hits you in the face this heat and I try to keep people in there I try to stand like if I'm leading the tour I try to stand there for a little bit so they have to experience it a little bit and we talk about it and I make that point is that okay we can walk out now but the plants are still here and our children will still be here so how are we going to address this yes and um and so 
I've, uh, there, I know there have been a lot of takeaways already and some recommendations that have come out of that, but are there maybe sort of top level, are there sort of leading inferences you've already drawn in this sort of experiment that you're already applying elsewhere at the botanic garden or are there sort of how do we want to go through them sort of in the hierarchy of the ones that have wow we've got to stop doing that or we've got to do this differently because of course it's not just heat and then just temperature heat can promote certain pests and diseases and make them more successful it can it interferes with water, <laughs> you know, it, it uses up the water faster. I mean, it has a lot of cascading impacts. It's not just it heat. It's, it's, it's heat and it's, it's frequency of, of water events. I know we're coming, we're still on a, I'd like to say we're coming out of a drought, but we're still in this drought um, yes. this year. And it's, I know at the gardens, it's, it's, it's very hard on the plants. And um, what, what we're trying to, what we're trying to show in the garden and, and think about we're actually taking our cues from our native landscape and looking at what plants we're going to that are perhaps going to be lost because the temperatures are going to get too high or the way that the precipitation patterns change they're not going to be able to survive um, but also looking at what's coming in um, both from a you know always I'm, at least I'm an optimist so what are the opportunities here and, and our seasons can be extended and we might be able to grow things longer but there's also the flip side of that, which um, the way that we talk about the plants in the garden is that we have some winners and we have some losers. And one of the winners that we tried out um, were we actually planted weeds in the garden. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> oh, you contrarian, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did really well inside this um, warmer, uh, inside the greenhouse where it was warmer and, and approximating this warmer climate. So they grew faster, they put on more seeds, and and in this in this very confined space, we had to harvest them rather quickly. But in an agricultural setting, we we can't do that. Or in our gardens, you know, it's it's going to be harder um, to keep up with those weeds. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, a, a scientist at uh, the botanic the National Botanic Garden in D.C. told me that uh, poison ivy likes the changing climate and is going to advance faster. So people will be really happy to hear that too. So. <laughs> Right. Oh, I, 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 I'm trying to laugh. Okay. Um, so, so, I mean, what do we do? Do we like change our planting times or do we water differently or, you know, what, what is it that like are these sort of top takeaways that you are already knowing for sure are action items that need, that we gardeners all need to implement sooner than later? Absolutely. One of our uh, collaborators on this project is uh, David Wolf, and he's a professor of, of horticulture, and he's written a lot about how we can adapt our um, gardens to climate change. And, and he uses the phrase, um, you know, add depth from the bench in, in your garden plantings. And I love that phrase. And it's to me, it basically means mix it up, add in more plants and, and more add more biodiversity. So the more biodiverse that our gardens can be, the greater our gardens will be able to adapt to these changes and we'll be able to see what works well, maybe what doesn't work so well. If we're having a particularly wet season, there may be something that doesn't work well, but something else will work well. Because of the, the um, likelihood of more droughts, there may be some plants that do well in that regard. And it's not just good for us, you know, and beneficial to us, but that, that increasing biodiversity also helps um, our ecosystem, especially the pollinators. Uh, right. And so we looked at two plants, two groups of plants in the climate change garden, and both are food plants, food plants for humans, and then food plants for pollinators. And this, one of the problems that we're, we're anticipating is what we call phenological mismatch. That is that the plants are gonna be blooming at times, most likely more um, earlier in the season than when the pollinators are around that need them and that the plants need to be pollinated. By. And so by increasing uh, our native plant biodiversity, um, that can help those pollinators find something. It can also help in our garden see what's working and, you know, really help the ecosystem as well as, you know, what we're looking at out of our windows and, and enjoying, you know, from our patios. Right. Um you know, with the vegetables, I feel like, I mean, and I'm in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York, uh, so in Zone 5B, and 
you know, we've been having a drought and we've had some sustained bouts of unusual heat and so forth. And I just feel like in recent years in general, my old calendar of when I do what is just so totally not the right calendar, you know, and it just, right. it's like, I, I just, you know, I had in my head, cause I've been gardening, you know, 30 plus years and I, you know, I knew when I did everything and, and it's just not the right times anymore. And I just wonder, like with the vegetables, especially, I, I don't know, you know, young plants can't hit into, I mean, they're not going to do so well if they're uh, young and tender and then suddenly a drought is starting in June and, and they've only been in the ground a couple of weeks. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I do. Yeah. The impacts. Um, it, it's, it's hard. Um, I'll put a shout out to our, you know, the botanic garden community around the U.S. So wherever your listeners may be from is is you can go to your local botanic garden because they've probably been dealing with this for a long time and have been trying to figure it out and how to care for their collections um, and have been experimenting. So at Cornell Botanic Gardens, that's what we've been doing with vegetable plants, but with also um, herbs and annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees is um, you know, I started there 20 years ago, and the director of horticulture then was bringing up plants that were not hardy for our zone, and and just trying them out. And some of them have have you know they've survived, and they're yeah. they're there in the landscape now. So, in in some ways, again, if you look at it from a positive perspective, you can start to diversify your landscape, maybe with things that we couldn't grow 20 years ago, um, and we may have to because we're going to lose some of the things that aren't going to be able to tolerate the changes in temperature and and the changes in, in precipitation yeah um so so we want to provide that depth in the bench that you spoke about that uh you cited dr wolf's uh one of his tenets of the future and so forth yes. um and we because we want to think about supporting pollinators you know even if there's that potential for mismatch phenologically and so forth of them being there at the wrong time we want to have a good palette of of things over a sustained period. Um, what are some of the other things? I mean, uh, should we change our planting and harvesting dates? Should we do water differently? I mean, are you changing anything about that in, in, in as a result? Well, we're paying attention to our frost date. So um, yeah. it has always been, you know, Memorial Day weekend was was always the benchmark. Like we wouldn't put out anything that was going to be tender until that date. Um, we have noticed in the last couple of years we can move, we can be a little more flexible with that, but also knowing that we've got to have, you know, some kind of protective, uh, re what is that? like reme is it? or a row cover or a ca some yes, kind of thank cap. you. <laughs> oh, no, yes, no, some... I, look, I can never remember my name most days, so don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, something like that. If the, the frost does come as early as expected, then, then we can protect it. But in general, we've been able to get some of the things earlier in the ground, and that's great because then they get going a whole lot sooner in, the, in our garden. So, so you, you may take advantage of some of this, like the last frost is coming earlier, and you may nudge the planting back a little bit, which would then mean on the other end, not bumping into the heat as young in their young lives. Um, and, and so you might do that, but you've got to have a backup plan for protecting them. So that's good. And uh, it seems like water is just so, so difficult. I mean, keeping up with watering uh, is so difficult. Um, and, and it seems like targeted watering systems you know, everybody for years has been saying, oh, we should be doing drip or we, you know, don't be spraying overhead, blah, blah, blah. But it seems like that's even more relevant advice now. Is there, are there any recommended insights about watering? Um, I think what you just mentioned, um, thinking about the, the localized watering drip irrigation is really good and using it where you can. And some of the, the practices of watering deep and long um, instead of just showering over the plants for, you know, a couple of seconds, but really getting um, the water at the soil where it's needed and for longer periods of time, um, trying to anticipate, you know, looking out at the weather and, and how that, how much water may be needed. Uh, we have tried that at different places in the garden and have been successful, and in other times we've just had to we water all the time everywhere because that it's just what's needed and there's never yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that uh, we've done is looking at um, our native landscapes and taking our cue from them about 
plants that are doing well in these harsher, you know, more drought conditions, hotter uh, temperatures, and what can we, what can we take from what's happening in those landscapes and bring either the plants into our garden or having a nearby water source for them. And um, that's, that's kind yeah. of how we do that. And yeah. just trying to not use as much water, um, even though our region is not predicted to have as severe a drought as other parts of the U.S., we still are very aware of that possibility and are trying to be conservative in what we use and where we use it. Yeah, I think that's critical planet-wide to be aware of that, yeah. And and so what about, um, I think in one of the articles I read about the project there um, in the demonstration garden, there was a recommendation about shrinking your garden's carbon footprint. So what about, you know, that, I mean, should we, is are you, are you looking at till versus no-till and the impacts or any other things like that about um, cultural methods? We do. There's a handful of, of easy things to think about with uh, decreasing your carbon footprint. One is is trying to use um, less carbon, and a lot of that come a lot of that carbon um, can come in the form of fertilizers, especially synthetic fertilizers. Yes. And if you can reduce your reliance on synthetic fertilizers and use more organic, like manure and compost, um, the better, the less carbon you're going to be using. And the added benefit of that is that if you're putting manure and compost into your soil, you're improving the soil health, which gets back to the question you were just we were just talking about with water, is that yes. the healthier the soil, the the greater the capacity is to hold that water. Um, or if we're in a you know, a heavy rainfall situation, it helps the water drain quicker too. So it's got these added benefits. Um, it takes a little bit more input on our part as a um to, you know, we can't just apply a, liquid fertilizer, we've got to work that organic matter into the soil or yes. put it on as a top layer, but it's in the long run, it's so much more beneficial. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think that's, I, I'm a, I've been forever, you know, old hippie type of mentality and I've been an organic gardener forever and I'm just not a, you know, I'm a compost person and I just top dress right. and so forth. And, and I have definitely moved away from uh, cultivating my vegetable beds uh, and instead just kind of, you know, cleaning up a little bit and making room with my fingers or a small, you know, a smaller implement or whatever uh, for getting those next seeds or seedlings in each year because turning this tilling does re, uh, release unwanted um, elements into the, into the environment. Right. So it's, right. it's yeah. So a sort of no-till even on our small garden levels is I think something else that we can do. Um, That's true. And and if we're mowing, you know, leave those yeah. clippings, you know, put your lawnmower on compost cycle and just leave them. I love this phrase, leave it a lawn. Um, <laughs> I didn't make it up, but I love it. Leave I, it a lawn. Go, leave it a lawn. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, you know, the other thing you can do, uh, like if we're talking about mowing, is just mow higher because then those grass um, roots go deeper and they go farther out and they'll be... Um, better able to withstand drought conditions because their roots are deeper and um, they go out farther. That's, you know, that's that's a really good practice. And then the other thing, and we have um, this at the Botanic Gardens is a, a native lawn where we've we're using native and low growing grasses instead of the traditional grasses that are often placed in our lawns. And what's nice about those is you don't have to mow them at all, so you can just get away from having a lawnmower altogether. And a lot of what we have in our um, in our native lawn is a, an oak grass, Denthonia, different two different species of Denthonia, and that that seems to work really well. And then we're able to interplant it with some meadow and woodland herbs um, for some color. And if you walk on it, then they're very fragrant. So you know, there's different ways that you can do that. Right. So it's it's besides not utilizing the resources required in mowing, um, it's also providing pollinator support and other insect support and, um, you know, food and habitat and who knows what. I mean, these kind of ground covers as opposed to a mown turf grass situation. Absolutely. Yeah, and so that's been a big the, part of what you've been doing there, too. That's been an important part of the Botanic Gardens work, I think, is. also. Yeah. And uh, I'll just add that there's um, one other technique that we used, especially over COVID, when we didn't have very many visitors and um, 
we weren't on campus as much to care for the garden is really we planted those six well there are 12 garden beds in total we planted um, several of them in cover crops um, so things like clover so that we could just keep the soil healthy and we didn't it didn't dry out totally and the benefit of, of that is it does that in between as an organic farmer you know it's it's a good um, in between crop and then if you a lot of those cover crops, if you work them back into the soil, add the, that organic nitrogen and other nutrients instead of um, using a syntho synthesized yeah. uh, fertilizer. We used to call it green manures. I, I, I yes. don't know if people use that term anymore, but green manure. So it's like you're growing your own green manure to turn in to, you know, if you don't have a cow <laughs> or a chicken. <laughs> right, right. Um, which cover crops? I mean, it, which it, everyone always asks me about that. Did you try different ones or do you have favorites yourself, for instance, that, you know, for fall and we're both in a colder zone, so we have winter to contend with. Did you did you um, do grasses or legumes or mixes or um... Um, it's mostly legumes that we've been using. Uh huh. So yeah. like which which crops would you like oh. field peas or things like that? Yes, I think that's the one. And yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the I'm one that sorry. I've. I, no, it's fine. I've I've used um, that sometimes, and sometimes I've mixed it with, like, oats. I think, and it's been interesting to see compared to the old. It used to be that all you could get was winter rye, but now a lot of the seed companies have a lot more diversity of cover crops available in smaller amounts for home gardeners too, which is great because you know it used to be it was a farm thing. It wasn't. Um, you right. couldn't get. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be on that large scale. You can do it on a small scale too. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's definitely a good one. Well, a totally on not a different subject, but a I noted in when I was reading your bio um, on the Cornell website, I noticed that you teach a class. And I I don't know if you still teach it, but it's called Plants and Human Well Being. Is that a true thing? <laughs> it, it is a true thing. I haven't I haven't offered it in a few years, but um, yes, it's a it's a class, and there are other classes at Cornell that now offer some of the things that I covered in that class. And, and the idea behind it was that, you know, in addition to just gardening, there are many other ways that plants are good for us. So time in nature, time spent with your hands in the soil, working around plants, being around plants, even if it's not in an interactive way, just looking at them. Um, there's a lot of research now that shows that that is beneficial to our well-being. It helps reduce our stress. It can help um, our, the way we learn, how much we retain. So we talk with um, students here at Cornell a lot about it, and we have a partnership with the Cornell Health Program here to really help students realize just how good nature and being around plants can be. So if they're stressed, they've got a test coming up, we tell them, you know, 20 minutes outside, looking at the trees, not on your phone, not cramming um, for your test uh, can be more beneficial to you and help you do better on that test than cramming. Yeah, and the not on your phone thing, I, I, I just, you must, as an educator in a, in a university, you must just see, because the students are, are digital natives, so to speak, they've been on the phone or the computer their whole lives. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it just seems like our, our heads are in there and you're absolutely right. I mean, even those 20 minutes, for me, even just looking out the window helps compared to staring into the screen, right? Um, it's true. Yeah. And, and I will say that as somebody who has studied this and somebody who tries to practice it, it's hard to do sometimes. Like I yes. have to remind myself, get off, step away from the computer, go outside and this beautiful botanic garden in which you work and, and, and de-stress for just a little bit. And as, yeah. as soon as I do that, it's, it's really, it's really helpful. Yeah. Are you a home gardener too, or do you get enough of it having all these projects and responsibilities at work? <laughs> are you a, do you have, are you a houseplant person or a backyard gardener or is any? any... I am both. So uh -huh. I try to take home what I learn at the gardens from my colleagues um, and and put it into place. So, and I was just noticing the other day, you know, for years I've been reading about creating these native habitats and bird friendly and pollinator friendly um, habitats. And, you know, you need water, you need a diversity of plants, you know, having some bird seed is good, but other plants that they can get seed yes. from, having places where they feel protected. Um, and I was looking out my window the other day and I thought, I've, I've done it because all of those things, bringing in native plants, having that water source, having lots of them, I, 
Um, I would I don't know that it would meet our aesthetic at the botanic garden level, but for my home landscape, those things it's true. And and then all those pollinators, whether they're birds or they're insects, they just add that more beauty to that landscape. Well said, and and boy, at Cornell, you have the Lab of Ornithology as inspiration and so many resources there, so I'm jealous. Um, we're just about out of time, and I just wanted to say thank you so much again. I know it's sort of that busy back-to-school time, and I, I really appreciate your taking the time, and also just to know about, and I'll, I'll give links with the transcript of the show over on awaytogarden.com, about the work you're doing where people can see more about it and um it's it's just so important uh and and the tips that you've given us today i, I much appreciate sonia so thank you so much for making time wow. thank you so much for talking with us and and yes thank you for sharing the links because there's work that my colleagues are doing that um i think would benefit a lot of your readers and just knowing about how they can do some of these things at home and and if they want some of the science behind all of all of this where we're getting our climate data and how we're using that those those are very helpful too We'll definitely give those in the transcript as you shared them with me. So thank you so much. Talk thank to you, you soon again, I hope. Thank you. Yes, I hope so too. Underwriting support from Color Blends, supplying top quality spring blooming Dutch flower bulbs to landscape professionals and ambitious home gardeners. More information on the web, colorblends.com. And I'll talk to all the rest of you soon again, I hope too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com and on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening, meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. <laughs>